That's it. Can I just say how good it is to be with you this morning and to be able to share in this, this important conference. Can I say a little bit about the team I brought up with me? Uh, James Cathcart is with me, and James works as part of the Sanctuary First team, and he's employed as Sanctuary First about 20 hours a week with us. Uh, and it's great to have James with us, and he's going to be sharing a wee bit uh, during, during the, the rest of the day. We also have with us uh, Neil McLennan, who is the Managing Director of Sanctus Media, but I'll tell you a little bit about how all that works in a moment. And it's great to have Neil with us. And we also have with us uh, Jim Steele, who's recently joined our team as a volunteer, but he comes and brings a lot of uh, experience from the business world. And so Jim is helping us develop and grow a uh, sanctuary first in, it, in hopefully new and exciting ways. I'll tell you a little bit about my post. I'm Albert Bogle. I was a parish minister in St Andrews Bowness for 34 years. And during that time, we developed a number of areas of outreach, from you know, developing the whole Vine Trust thing, which is an overseas development work, to thinking about how we use modern technology within worship. I think we're probably, I think probably we'd safely say we were probably the first church in the Church of Scotland to use screens and to have video projectors way back in the early 90s. Uh, and we started to think about how all that could be used in worship. So we, we've traveled this road for a long time. And it's through developing worship through uh, Sanctuary First, now it's called Sanctuary First, but at one time it was called TGI Sunday, which was a, a, a contemporary worship service that we had in a, on a, once a month in the church, where we, we started to have screens and all that kind of stuff, and that was way back in the early 90s. And through that we developed, started to think about how we could produce material to put in the screen, and that eventually led us to producing, having a project in the church, which was a multimedia project, where, yes, what's your problem? Well, thank you. I don't think it's any better. But, okay. The thing is, I don't like shouting too much because I get excited after a while and then it gets too loud, I can tell you, and then it stops me from speaking because then I get, so, keep, ride the, ride the volume. So, so we, we then threw out of worship and creating worship material, we developed this St Andrew's Multimedia Youth Project, which began to create new material and original material so that we could use that in the screens. And eventually that has grown into Sanctus Media, which is a media company because at one point our church accounts were were growing so much that at one point our turnover was something, all the things we were involved in, it was a lot of money, I won't tell you what it was, but it was a lot of money and it was too much for the treasurer and all the church accounts to be controlling it. So for governance, we, we moved the media stuff right out of the church accounts and we set up a separate media company called Sanctus Media and Neil was the managing director of that. Now that company was set up and came out of worshipping community and came out of worship. So it's not about making money, it's about seeking to support and develop the life of the church. And so Neil's comes, you might think, as an outside company, but he's not really, he's part of the family of the Church of Scotland and as an elder within St Andrew's Bowness and continues to serve the church in a much wider way like Sanctus now. We stream the General Assembly for the Church of Scotland and all these things. So Sanctus Media is very much a, 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 something that's grown out of worship and is there to serve the church. So that's the kind of symbiotic relationship that we have. And so we all work very closely together. And Sanctus, of course, maintain the website for, Vine, for not only Vine Trust, but also for, for Sanctuary First as well. So you see, we're all kind of... It's very incestuous, this, isn't it? But that's how it all works, and we support one another and help one another. Now, now that you've got a little picture of where that comes from, Fal Falkirk Presbytery, in their wisdom, allowed me to demit my charge and begin to work solely with Sanctuary First to develop it into an online worshipping community. And I started as a pioneer minister 
with Falkirk Presbytery in 2016. And then James joined me uh, towards the end of 2016 to start to build a team in Sanctuary First. And now we have James working with us. We also have a, a, an administrator who works with us. And we also have someone who looks at the analytics of the website and gives us information regularly, you know, about who's on the site and what's been used and what's not been used. And that's so important for us to begin to understand how we can be a caring a, a online worshipping community. So we're a team and we're growing the team. And although Jim doesn't quite know it yet, but Jim's getting pulled in more and more. To, he's a volunteer, but he's coming in more and more to work with us as part of that team. Now, at the outset, I want to say we are not here and I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not here to sell you a program. I'm not here to sell you technology. In fact, if you think technology is the answer to the renewal of the Church of Scotland, then you're in the wrong place because that's not where we're coming from. We don't think that. And I'm not here to tell you about how great technology is. I'm here to remind you about how wonderful the message is that we have to share. And at the heart of everything, technology has to be the servant to the message and not the message itself. And that's such an important thing to grasp and understand. We are not about trying to sell you gizmos or tell you to start doing this because it will increase your congregation. It won't. Because that's not what it's about. It's about something else. So it's easy to think that technology is the answer to the church problems. And it's easy to pretend that if you've got video streaming in your church, numbers will go up. And it's easy for ministers to get caught up in this and to think this is the latest thing and to, to start getting a, a, a campaign in the church to say we want video cameras in the church, we want this, we want to live stream our services. And I say to ministers, look at what you want to live stream. Does anybody want to watch it? <laughs> because they're not exactly queuing up outside to watch the live ven venue, are they? So do you really want to watch that? And I say to churches, and you want to live stream, do you? Have a look at your building. First thing you see is organ pipes, brown wood. You're telling everyone the brand is Victoriana. Come to Victoriana. Do you see what I'm saying? So maybe we don't want to live stream that bit of the church. And Jim is going to talk to you about maybe you want to live stream the real church, the people, the smiles, the engagement with people, the stuff that's happening that isn't there on a Sunday, but this real church beginning to make a difference in the community. That's just another thought for you to think about. So we don't want you to think that live streaming is the answer because it's not. The most effective method of communication is you. Your smile, your daily life, and your daily walk with Jesus. Because if, if you haven't got that, then you haven't got a message to share. And so we need to be growing within the life of the congregation. Men and women, boys and girls, who are sold out on Jesus. Not in the church, by the way. We need to stop talking about, and again, this is the big issue we've got in the church. Got all this governance, all this stuff about going through this and there. And, blah, 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 blah. and it's like a huge, big organization. And what I'm learning is we need to cut through all that. And we need to get back to what it's all about. What is it all about? Transformation. Lives being transformed. What does the Apostle Paul tell us? If any man or woman be in Christ, they are what? Good church members. <laughs> if any man or woman be in Christ, they are what? New creations. A church full of new creations. God at work in our life, changing us in order that we might bring the gospel, the message of the new creation of transformation to our communities and to our world. 
And so the most important and the most effective piece of communication is your walk with God and your life. And you know, that means also the internal politics of our congregations. What's more important to get right is the relationships with your church sessions and with your congregations and with one another. So many of our congregations are paralyzed because of what? Bad relationships. The very thing that we're talking about and preaching about, have a new creation and be, be transformed in Christ, and yet within ourselves, we are not transformed. And we're not living that transformed life in our daily lives in our congregations. People are arguing about this and the next thing. There's tension, struggle. Ministers are continually talking about it. I hate to tell you, and I would, I would, I'd hate to give you the figures, but the number of ministers that are off in the church of Scotland with stress would scare you. And the number of elders that are off with stress that's never registered, they just don't come anymore. Oh, and then that doesn't count the number of members of the congregation who are off with stress. In other words, the off church because they've been stressed out with it. Don't want any more of it. So we need to ask ourselves, what is it that we're doing in church that's causing stress instead of bringing harmony, bringing renewal and transformation? That's a talk for another day. But I'm just throwing these things up for us to start thinking about. You come to hear about the digital church and you say, oh, we came away depressed. No. <laughs> I'm not meaning you to be depressed, but I want you to begin to see that what we're talking about here is how we connect and communicate the gospel with confidence. And I think that's what we need to find, a new confidence in the gospel, which is a phrase, it's not my phrase, it's a phrase that Peter Bissett had many, many years ago. And those of you who are old enough to remember that, are way back from St. Ninian's Creef. And there's a report that when it was, when it was the Board of Mission, they've changed that many titles again. The older you get, you start to say, all we do is change the Titanic chairs in the, de you know, in the Titanic. We'll now call ourselves the Council of such and such. And will that make a huge difference? No. But we spent five years reorganizing ourselves to what? We need to get back to what we're about gospel of Jesus that changes lives and we need to be able to share that with one another and you know there's no amount of training courses you can go on, there's no amount of bits of paper that are put in front of you to tell you how to do this and no programs will do it you don't get a program or a paper or a book that tells you how to fall in love with someone and you don't get a book that tells you how you tell your mother and your father and your granny and your son and your daughter how you fell in love. You do it your own way, don't you? We need to release people to tell people about how they've come to know Jesus in their own way. And encourage people to say, start doing it. Start doing it. Because all over the world and all over our, our, our country, people are searching and longing and looking for something that's missing. And that's not new. Augustine said it. The heart is restless until it finds its rest in God. I believe this. You see, I believe this. And that's why I get into conversations with people all the time. Yesterday the guy was come to check our house to, to give sign off the electricity. You know, we were getting a refurbishment done and you know you need you need to get a, a certificate so as you can get all your work signed off if you've had a building program done and you know that kind of thing. And the, the, so the guy's doing it and I just came in for five minutes and said, Have we chat with him? 
Before long, he was telling me all kinds of things about himself. And before long, he started to tell me how he lost some weight and he was, he was looking for um, just to feel a lot better about himself. And before long, I said, hey, you need to get your body in fit. He said, absolutely. And I said, body, soul, and spirit. I said, what about your spirit? He says, hey, you're right there too. And we started to talk about spiritual things. Within a space of five minutes. Or the man I went down to see just two days ago to tell him we've got, we've got this orchard and we've got a lot of apples and we want to get rid of the apples. So I went into the man in the brewery about the apples. There's a wee brewery in Bridge of Allen where I live. And I said, look, I have all these apples. Any, could you use them? Oh, I would use them. How much money do you want from them? I don't want anything. Just come up and take the apples. What do you do for a living? I'm a Church of Scotland's online minister. I'm for the people who don't go to church. Hmm. Somewhere along the line I get lost. I used to go to church every Sunday. Opened up a conversation with a guy. And he says, by the way, give me your email address. I'll sign up to your online church. It's just two conversations I had this week. Do you want me to tell you about them all? <laughs> Can I ask you what about your conversations this week? And do you think people don't know that you're a Christian? Well, you're kidding yourself on because they do. And they've just been waiting for you to tell them. Oh, and by the way, the program for bringing the youth into the church. Do you know the latest program, the most effective program to bring youth into the church? It's you. Can I ask how many of you here have got children or grandchildren in your family? How many of you here? Quite a lot. How many of your grandchildren or grandchildren go to church? Not too many. Some of them do. Some of them. If you have them in your house, you can tell them the stories of Jesus. You can tell them about your faith. And that's the most effective Sunday school teacher you will ever discover. Why am I telling you all this? Because I don't want you to get mesmerized with the brilliance of technology. <coughs> Put it in its place. Now that doesn't mean to say that we're not evangelists for technology. We love it. But we keep it in its place. Because the message is much more important. And by the way, technology will never ever compete with a personal relationship. Meeting and seeing someone face to face is always superior. But relationships can truly be built on the internet and developed on the internet and we're going to talk about that and equally good relationships but we can take these relationships and grow them so that we can have face to face encounters with one another with people on the internet as well so people say to me so what's going to change the church what is the big, what's the big thing we need to do and I, I, I think it's back to this personal encounter with Christ, our personal stories, and our, our personal devotion to the Lord Jesus, and our love of beauty and beautiful things. And we, we live in a world where people are really interested in, in style, aren't they? Interested in style, and even if you've always, some of you have come here today, you've probably thought what you might wear today. And all that, and that, because somehow there's, God has made us to enjoy design, to enjoy beauty, to enjoy good things. And therefore, that can be a starting point. That can be a very common point for us to begin to share and speak about the gospel. Because it's about the Spirit of God changing us and making us into, yes, beautiful people. Yeah, there's no, we, we are quite amazing people. I'm beginning to see that 
and beginning to, to affirm that in one another and affirm that around our world is the beginning of the change in people's lives. So, we are the living, breathing technology of God and there's no piece of man-made technology that is as good as we are. And that's such an important thing to keep in our thoughts. So, people say to me, you know, maybe the answer is if we could just get back to the past and just get back to having people back in church again. And, you know, when are we going to see, you know, 200, 300 people sitting in the pews on a Sunday morning at 11 o'clock? When is that? Is that, you know, and, and it's only, that's what we see church as. And I think we have to do a huge mindset change. Now, I'm not saying that, that can't, God's Spirit can't bring back two, three hundred, four hundred people to sit in church on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. I'm not saying that can't happen. But I'm saying it probably won't happen that way. That's what it was then. But we're now in a new era. Things are changing. The, our world changes. The pressures on how people live their life, everything has changed. Our, the way, we, the way we communicate, the way we talk, everything around us has changed. Families are no longer in, 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 in settled communities. And, and this is our problem. We are trying to build a geographical church when in actual fact people don't live in the geographical areas that we're talking about. People have communities and friendships in different places. You know, so somebody can be, can be living in a rural area, but working in a city. And most of their friendships can be in a city and not in a rural area. And we've got to take account of that and understand that. And, so, and people, the way they organise their life is so different from what it used to be. So we need to think and begin to think about what, and that takes us into this whole area, a fresh expression of church. And I think every church in Scotland needs to be thinking, every geographical church needs to be thinking about what it means to be a fresh expression of the church in their community that they know. And the trouble is, some of our communities that we know within our Church of Scotland, are, we've narrowed them down to the community that meets at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning. That's all the people that can meet at 11 o'clock is possible. That, that we've narrowed it to that. And we need to think much in a much wider way. And we've narrowed it down to all the people who quite like coming to buildings that are Victoriana and that uh, are, are modern Victorian. Because modernism is Victorian. You know that, don't you? And that all these institutions that have even the institution of the Church of Scotland is modernism because it's Victoriana. And you know, the nineteenth century invented modernism. And so we're living, people who want to live in that era, but then people who don't want to live in that era come into this and they think, well, this is not where I want to be. And then we've got tensions in the church because the people say, well, I quite like it like this. That's just how I want it to be. And that's the tension. But being willing to find new expressions of that, how can we express the faith in a different way? is so important. So that leads us to start thinking about how we can use technology to begin to connect with people. Remember I was telling you about the man in the brewery? See, this has all been thought up. This is not, no. Remember I told you about the man in the brewery? Remember I told you about the electrician? By the way, I did tell you that the electrician told me that he caught on to this and he said, you know, you're absolutely right. If we just go back one generation, my mum and dad went to church and my granny went to church. So I said to him, so if you were, if you had to get involved in any kind of spirituality, where, where would it be? Oh, where would it be? The church of Scotland. So you see, 
You know the book has been written recently and everybody's been talking about it and it was like as though a light bulb had gone on and nobody had ever heard of this before, The Invisible Church. You know, I hate to tell those who have fallen over their feet about how important the book is. It's a great book, by the way. I'm not knocking it. Every parish minister that's ever worked in the parish for any more than two years knows that out there in the parish there are more people who believe in Christ and are Christians out in the parish than in church on a Sunday. We know that. And by the way, so do you. (laughs) The invisible church is there. And that's what Sanctuary First is doing. It's connecting with the people who don't go to church but have got faith. A different, a different writer every week <coughs> takes the, the material that we produce and, and that James and I work on and we look at the lectionary and we think, oh, that's boring. And then we say, how can we spice it up a wee bit? How can, how can we get a title? How can we get a title that we just get somebody to think about that? How can we think about that passage in a different way? And then we come up with titles and we come up with themes get people back into the Bible again to start reading the Bible and then we ask the writers we say so that's your themes go and work on it and by the way can you write a prayer for each day and please don't make it boring can you please make the prayer connect with where people are at in their everyday life the funny thing is the writers come back to us and say we really enjoyed that and then some ministers would say to me enjoyed doing that more than I did writing the sermon. And then you say, well, do you not get the point? And why don't you just write the sermon like that? <laughs> and people might actually listen and enjoy your sermon as well. <laughs> oh, right. So Sanctuary First is using people, the gifts of the church, communicators within the church, elders, ministers, just Christian people who are writers, and feel as though they've got something to say, they take a week and they take the passage that they've got the starter given, they write, reflect upon it, and then write the prayer. This week, it, if you've been following Sanctuary First, it's been Dr. Jimison down in, in Larks. And it's funny on the Facebook, you see some of his patients coming on the Facebook saying, he's an awful nice man, you know, doctor. <laughs> and yes, you see, that's the point. People who are maybe not going to church but they see the doctor in the parish willing to say, I'm a Christian, willing to write about his faith, willing to tell, talk about the songs he likes that changes his life, and is open to that. <coughs> it makes himself vulnerable. And that's the challenge for us as Christian men and women, to make ourselves vulnerable. You're a school teacher. Oh, I, I, I can't really... I better not live in my community because I, I want space for my children. Oh, really? But as parish ministers, we have to live in the community. <coughs> we live it out. The good and the bad. If we're Christian people, we need to grasp the nettle and be relevant and real in places where people are. It's actually first is seeking to do that, to connect with those people who are out there, who are interested. And how do we get them? I need you to be the connector. Because you see, you know all the people who have given up in church. And you know why they're not coming, you don't tell anyone. I know, we all do it. I'm not going to tell them that. I know that Jean doesn't come because do you know what so and so said? And she said so that and Scott and she's never really gone back since. It's nothing to do with the minister. But everybody thinks it's to do with the minister. Well, it's just, I don't want to talk about it. And we all know the reasons why people have given up. So I say to you, why don't you go to these people and just give them a sanctuary first card, which we've got little cards printed. You can just pass it out to someone and say, have a look at that, Willie. I think you might find that helpful. Because I know you're a Christian, but you can't get on at church, and I don't blame you. Sometimes I struggle as well. But there's a card that might help you in your Christian walk because it's helped me. Do you see what I mean? And you become the connector that connects to the people who have given up in church. 
And people start getting involved. And as they start getting involved, their lives start to change. This invisible church of believing people out there, do you know, I hope you're getting excited about this. Because if you really played your cards right, you could have a different kind of church. A different kind of church. You might not want to use the building you've got, but that might not be a bad thing. If you've played your cards right, you could maybe do something completely different. That like phone call I got from the girl. Hey, are you Mr. Bogle? Did you go to, and she told me about, did you go to St. Cyrus Church when you were a, a young boy? I said, oh, my mother knows you. Oh, really? I found you on the internet. Can I ask you about, could you, I would like to get married. And then she told me a long story about how she had been brought up in church as a wee girl and had faith, but stopped going as, we, as so many people have done, as some of us have done, and found a connection back, right? Not everybody goes Sunday after Sunday after Sunday forever, right? And she said, I lost my way. And I didn't want to go to the minister and ask the minister to marry me because I felt that was, you know, I shouldn't do that. By the way, that's what people are doing today. You know that. And you know, they're, they're doing that to their funerals. They're saying, I really don't want to ask because I feel as though I've not been going to church. But it's not that I don't believe. But that's... So I'll, I'll go and get a, a celebrant to do that or I'll go and get maybe somebody else to do the wedding. So this girl went and she, she went to the wedding fair and she was looking for somebody that might do a wedding that would be a kind of Christian and there was nobody there but the humanist guy was very helpful and he signed her up and signed her up to become a member of the humanist society because that's what this particular man thought was important and so she, she and her, her partner signed up to be part of the humanist society and then she texted them back and said, or emailed them back and said could I have maybe this hymn and uh, I was thinking about would you be able to say a prayer the guy came back and said, you've misunderstood. We don't believe in God. If you want something like that, you need to go to a church. And so she paid a fee for a year to the Humanist Society. And she said, can I cancel that? He said, oh yeah, that'd be all right. So she cancelled her fee to the Humanist Society. And she said, now where do I go? She went on to church and got on the web page to try and find a way around that one. And well, it's interesting. There's a blog going to be posted in Sanctuary First about this story. I hope you might read it. Because she's going to then tell how difficult it was for her to try and find some kind of way to think about getting married. And eventually her mum short-circuited it and said, I think I know a guy. <laughs> and it just so happens that it was Sanctuary First. And you see, and my argument to those who say, you're... you're you know, you're an interloper into my parish. I'm sorry, I'm an internet. The internet doesn't know parish boundaries. <laughs> oh, by the way, did you not know the Holy Spirit doesn't know about parish boundaries either? <laughs> Interesting thought, isn't it? What would happen if we get rid of the parish boundaries? Interesting. We might get rid of some of the presbyteries. <laughs> what happened if we got rid of some of the presbyteries and became more nimble? More fresh expressions all around the place. More difficult to keep track on right enough. But that might not be a bad thing. So Lorna's getting married two weeks' time on Sanctuary First, and her pictures are going to be on the web, the Sanctuary First webpage. And she's so excited about it. Oh, and by the way, she's coming to the next Sanctuary First service in Edinburgh at the Fringe. 
And the brain tries to barge. See, I pull them all into all the different things. You see what I'm saying? And you're that excited. Get out there, make it happen. Why can you make it happen? Because I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. We can create a new kind of church. One that's fit to communicate and connect with the people around about. Oh, by the way, farming communities, people say they're very hard. That's what a nonsense. Some of the greatest believers are in the farming community. They just don't get to church on a Sunday. Sanctuary First had a service for the farmers over at Gilkanak last year. We had 200 people turn up. And the home baking was fantastic. <laughs> and how did we get them all there? Because we got somebody from the National Union of Farmers to come and talk about an issue that they were interested in. <laughs> and we streamed it out. And the rest of the farming community in that area all heard it and all said, and that was fantastic. And that was the church did that for us. No, it was Andy Campbell, who was the parish minister, who was well connected with the ministers, with the, with the, with the farmers, and knew the people, and knew the parish. Creative, isn't it? It's not doing it the old way. It's finding new ways, and using our creativity, and letting the internet become the conductor, the tool that takes the message out to those around. So I'm going to stop there because I'm going to give you five minutes or so for questions because uh, Neil's going to come and talk about technical stuff because I'm sure some of you are really interested in that. But it, it will not be technical stuff that will go over your head. It will be technical stuff that will help you begin to think about how we can use the internet to begin to share the message. But any comments or questions about what I've been saying this morning? Questions? Comments? You mentioned Victoriana in terms of physical spaces. Um, and I agree with that. I, I have a, a crematorium theory of church architecture. Most people see something like a church when they go to a funeral. Started up making crematoria look like churches because they comforted people, and now we've got churches that look like crematoria. Um, so I take that point, but the problem seems to me to have become oh, there's a problem which is a kind of cultural Victorian, which is largely about people standing up at the front, so it's called what they should. assumption being that the knowledge and the expertise exists mm -hmm. on the front. We've got 200 years of a notion of professional ministry being central to the church, um, disabling, positively discouraging lay ideas and involvement. Um, and I think the problem of architectural Victoriana is relatively simple to solve. I think you make some interesting points there and I think uh, that there are aspects of church that we can broadcast and if we don't want to broadcast Sunday morning 
There are other aspects of the life of church that we might broadcast, and Jim's going to tell us a wee bit about that, about what he's been exploring on the internet, which is, you know, um, that other part of the life of the church that is sometimes a, is, is the real church, without, you might say, the church without walls, but the relational things, the dimension of people's lives, where it's making a difference in people's lives and caring for people. And those members of the church who are prepared at a one-to-one -one level to talk about, about, about the hard issues, about politics, about sex, who are doing it regularly in their everyday walk, you know, but they're not, maybe not talking about it from front of church, but they're certainly trying to explore it within the lives of their own community. But you make a good point. Is there someone here? Somebody here? No? No? How do you access your daily devotions? Yeah, you, well, you just simply go on. There's Is a, it a Facebook they're on now? There's on, they're on Facebook, but they're also on the sanctuaryfirst.org.uk. And if you go onto the website, you'll see there's a tab at the top which has various things. J James is actually going to walk you through this this afternoon, so you'll get a chance to do all that. So James, will, that's part of James is going to do that today. Um, with with the, the sea change in culture since the 60s and progressing into uh, postmodernism, you do have a real cleavage in the society between the traditionalists, those who want to hold on to tradition, and those like yourself uh, and others who want to branch out into new initiatives. How do you keep those who are sincere believers in the traditional camp, how do you keep them on board with modern church uh, so as not to alienate unnecessarily, to give offense or... You know, the, 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 yeah. the, the, the two wings there that yeah, we seem to be diametrical. I think, I think in music, for example, they're two di very different... Uh, I think there's no reason why we can't run Parallel, par things in parallel lines. I mean, we, we did it actually in Bonex for many years. I used to run three services on a Sunday so that they would have, have options for people. And people who started it used to say to me, oh, you're splitting, you're splitting the church, we're dividing the church into three. And I'd say, well, we'll, we'll go over the church into three congregations, but that not be good. You know, so because it's recognising that there are different ex expressions and honouring people. So that you know, you might have a service where it is traditional, and you wear you, you wear your robes and you, you use the, the organ, and then you might go into something <coughs> which is more 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 free. It doesn't necessarily need to be singing all hill songs music, you know, which can be a bit boring. But you know, you can sing other kind of music as well. Then you can sing a you know, you can sing some of John Bell stuff, which is great. But again, if you had it every week, it would be boring. And it's, so you've got to mix it up. And I think we can have contemporary worship that's, that, that, that doesn't need to be um, killing your ears. You know, but by the way, also traditional worship can kill your ears because you go to the wrong place and the organist is having a field day and he has a hard organ, uh, but nobody else can hear a word because somebody's playing this organ so, so loud. You know, so it's, you know, it's not one or the other. It's, again, getting people to understand how we can keep... But I think that what I've been saying to people is try and keep the two things together. Get the, those who want the traditionalists to give permission for the other to happen. And for those who want to move on to respect the tradition, because it's out of the tradition they have now got moving on to do something different. And there is no reason why someone can't enjoy... You know, sometimes... I might want to go to a traditional service and enjoy it, just singing traditional hymns and having a, a traditional feel. And I might even want to go to Victoriana sometimes. But maybe we need to just have that variety. Which is more work and it creates more teams and more people to work together as a team to make it all happen. Because that's, I think, kind of just an answer to what you were saying about ministers. Leadership, what we, what we desperately need in the church today is ministers who are leaders, not managers. <laughs> and that's the problem. We have ministers who want to be managers. Let somebody else manage. You're the leader. And if you don't know what the difference between a leader and a manager is, come in, that's another seminar on another day. <laughs> but it's a huge difference, by the way. Huge difference. And, and that's where churches get unstuck. Because they call a minister who's a manager. We don't need a manager because there's 
five other managers all sitting there in, in the court session who maybe are more senior and can even do it better than he or she thinks they can do it as the minister. So it's leadership we need in the church. And that, that answers some of these questions we're talking about, how we cope with it, topics that are hot potatoes to begin to talk within the life of the church. Because the leader begins to engage with people and understand how to make that happen within the community. Big, big area when we look for a minister. Look for a leader. Don't look for a manager. Can I just bang the drum for the guild, please? Um, yeah. we, uh, we had, we created an action plan as opposed to the Church of Scotland's proposals to go back and consider things and then come back and talk about it and then propose something else. And, and we had 600 new members last year over the whole of the guild. And with the projects that they support, they are seen particularly by younger people as relevant and important. And um, I think that we have to be seen to be relevant and important. And people like to see things being done. And although the Guild isn't just about projects, you know, it is about developing faith as well. But I think that you can actually see something tangible. Um, you, you're going to Malawi and supporting this group, and you know, I think and, and HIV and trafficking, and and uh, I think it, it's seen as being relevant. And I think that we need in worship to make people realise that we are relevant for today. <coughs> It might be Victorian surroundings, but it's still as relevant today as it was years ago. And maybe that's the message that we need to get over. So that was me, just me banging the drum a oh, bit. Thank you. <laughs> banging the drum for the guild. I'm going to ask Neil now to come forward and just share um, before you know, Neil's going to take about 40, 45, 50 minutes just with the intent for stuff.